Wait a second. All right, awesome. So uh, this week we're going to be covering the nuts and bolts and th of things because this week we are going to talk about bah, 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 fasteners. So what is a fastener? Why do we need them? So a fastener is an important object that connects or joins two pieces of material. Uh, fasteners are really important uh, to the design process as they are how you're going to put together a majority of your items uh, that you make. And their placement, quality, quantity, and size can have uh, an effect on the performance of the design. So let's look at some examples of fasteners. So you might be familiar with most of these, maybe not all of them, but probably most of these. Uh, a bolt is the most standard fastener. They are generally the strongest, uh, but can sometimes loosen. If you've ever had a part loosen with a nut on it uh, due to vibrations, um, they're generally paired with a nut though they can be threaded directly into a part, and we're going to be talking about that. Uh, threads, when I mention them, are these ridges on the side of the part that allow them to screw together. So these are internal threads on the nut here, and these are external threads on the bolt. Uh, washers can be used as spacers, but uh, more generally they're designed to even out the load from a bolt. Uh, this protects the part from the bolt and sometimes even the bolt itself. Um, we have a pin here, so pins can be used to stop rotation and are normally designed uh, or can be designed to be the first thing that fails in the assembly. So if they were to fail, a more uh, important part or maybe a more expensive part wouldn't be loaded as much and break. Uh, so th maybe the pin fails first. Um, set screws are used to stop shafts from rotating. Usually they are placed on uh, D cuts in shafts. So a D cut on a shaft is if you imagine a cylindrical element, but instead I took like a knife and I cut along its profile. So it looks like a D now when I look at it from the side, like the external profile of a D, uh, but it has that one flat side. Usually a, a, a set screw comes down and touches that portion to stop rotation of the shaft or uh, to keep something rotating with the shaft. Uh, multiple may, may be used in the same shaft uh, if the design calls for that. Um, the last uh, common type of fastener that we're going to talk about is the rivet. Uh, so rivets are used to join two pieces, usually two pieces of sheet metal together, two pieces of thin material together. Uh, they are more permanent compared to a bolt, uh, but they sort of operate in the same way a pin does. They lock it in rotation and, and keep things from sliding against each other. Um, it can also be used to break before a component does like a pin does. Um, but the difference between rivets and bolts and uh, some of these other fasteners that we're going to talk about is rivets are permanent. Once you put them in, they are need to be drilled out to be replaced. Um, they're generally used as physical uh, fasteners that deform when they're placed into a material. So they actually uh, change shape in a permanent way uh, when they're used to fasten two pieces of sheet metal together together. All right, let's uh, let's talk about bolts because that's everybody's favorite thing. So here are some different types of bolts. Uh, the first is a flathead. So flathead is like the name is it is flush to the surface of the part. So this face of the bolt would be flush to the external surface of your part. Um, in order to this to be the case, you need to remove some material to make the part to make the uh, in the part part to make space for the head. So if you imagine uh, it's sort of hard to tell here, but usually flats have ha ha like a, a triangular taper to them. So they have the flat head here, they have a triangle and they have the, the threads come down this way. Um, in order the process of removing material at the same angle of the flat heads angle so that it really fits into the part is called countersinking. Um, there are different angles for the bolt and there are different countersinking angles. And if you let's say like 45 degrees is one of them and maybe 30 degrees or 60 degrees is one of them. And if you mix those up, the, bo the bolt won't sit flat like it should. So when you're countersinking, definitely make sure that you have the right uh, angle cut out for your uh, countersink. Uh, the next is a socket head. So this, the difference between a flat and a socket head is this is generally the socket portion is generally above the uh, part profile. Um, this also applies to the next bolt, the button head, except the difference between these two is that you can see this, this one has like a rounded cap feature, while this one has a more cylindrical element. Um, 
The bottom left is the hex head. This is the most common type of ball. So these are the ones we see almost all the time in industry or um, in like industrial applications. So its profile sticks out above the threads again, uh, but this one needs to be tightened by like a wrench uh, or a socket set maybe. Um, there are other types of bolts as well, the Phillips head, uh, Phillips heads. Um, so I'm sure some of you at least know that the Phillips head refers to like this uh, pattern of how you screw in the bolt. Um, these are not super, I haven't seen these really commonly used. I've never seen a Phillips head bolt. Uh, but maybe maybe some people have out there. They exist. Uh, and the last is a shoulder screw. So the shoulder screw's difference between, uh, let's say, the socket head and the shoulder screw is that it has this unthreaded portion. So again, the threads are these, what actually screws in the bolt, uh, these lines, these, these uh, spiraling up the uh, shaft of the screw. Uh, and a shoulder screw has an unthreaded portion. And so you can use this in applications where you want something to run on the surface of this bolt and treat it like an axle or anything that can just, you don't want, you don't want this to be threaded. You can also use this when the bolt is like super duper long. So let's say you had like a six inch bolt, but it only actually threads in at the very end. You could not have a threaded portion here just because it's a hassle and you don't want to thread the whole thing. It might be cheaper as well to buy a partially threaded portion. Um, one thing to notice is that the shoulder portion, this, this unthreaded portion is larger in diameter than the threaded portion. Yeah. All right, so bolt naming, how do we refer to bolts? Uh, the metric, I think the metric system is super easy and it's what I use most of my designs in, and that's definitely true for bolt naming. Uh, the first is, so usually bolts in uh, metric are referred to like, the example here is M4.7. Um, and so the first number is the nominal hole size. So that is the actual size of the hole that you'll be placing this bolt into. And the second is the distance between threads. So every thread, the vertical distance, or I guess horizontal, depending on how you're holding the ball, just the distance between the threads is uh, 0.7 millimeters. Um, yeah, that's referred to as the pitch, the thread pitch. Imperial, as always, is very confusing. I know there's a lot of people out there who like Imperial. I'm not one of them. Uh, the first number, if it is above a quarter inch, it will be the actual value. So it'll be like three eighths or half an inch or something. But once we get below <laughs> a quarter of an inch, it sort of goes wonky. So every size smaller than a quarter of an inch is given a number between a uh, common size is given a number between zero and 12. And you will have to look at, maybe you're good enough to remember the numbers, but you will have to look at a chart if it's like a 440 bolt. Uh, you have to look up what four means in Imperial uh, for the nominal hole size. Um, the second number is actually pretty easy in Imperial. It's threads per inch. So if you have a, a, a quarter 20, that means that you have a quarter inch nominal hole with 20 threads per inch. Um, yeah, some examples down here. I have no idea what these sizes are. 440, 256, 832s. I would need a chart. That's why it's bad. Um, Yeah, so bolts come in a wide variety of threading. Uh, they can come in coarse threading, which means the distance between the threads is very large, um, which is pretty common, or very, very fine threading, which is very strong if you truly need it, but most applications don't need that uh, level of threading. Another note is that bolt length here, uh, when we refer to bolt length or how long the bolt is, we is measured by the amount of bolt that could stick into a material theoretically. So if we look at this, um, we have a shoulder bolt here with a threading distance. The bolt length is from the very, very bottom of the, um, the bolt head to the end of, this, of the bolt. So it is all the material that could enter the part. Also, some uh, another important thing to mention here is thread engagement. I actually think maybe we go out on that next slide. Let me check it real quick. Yeah, okay. So generally, you want the material around. These are just some notes in the bolts uh, when using them for tips and tricks and best practices. Generally, you want the material around the actual hole 
to be at least the radius of the bolt to prevent failure. So this means that I'm using a uh, quarter inch bolt hole. Uh, the material around it should at least have 0.125 inches. Um, so we can prevent like failure from making that hole present. Um, another thing is that for to make sure that you have a good tight and consistent uh, hold from bolts, you want to make sure if you're using a nut that you have at least three threads after the nut uh, to make sure you really keep that hole. And it says here a di diamond is worth of thread engagement. So what that means is that if you have, let's go back to this. Uh, if I have a quarter inch uh, bolt right here, I would need a quarter inch vertically of thread engagement. So these new threads need to actually be in the nut or in the part if the part is, uh, has threads in it uh, for it to be considered like, like good. It will give you the best results. Um, a little bit about stripping. So stripping is when you deform the threads or bolts enough that the part is no longer usable. And this usually results. So if you ever used a Phillips head, uh, you put it in and it's maybe it's an old bolt. It sort of breaks down and you turn and turn and turn, but you can't get it out. That is what a bolt is stripping. And that can happen with a lot of different um, types of methods to screw in something. But um, this usually results in something getting stuck and is no good. So we don't use Phillips head because they uh, strip pretty easily. Um, and finally, so this last note, if you have a bolt going through a number of parts, you should only tap the bottom most part relative to the bolt head. So if I have bolt head here, uh, one material, material one, let's say it's steel here, the material two, it is plastic and then it's steel again only the last steel should be tapped. Um, and that's so that you don't get these parts on the threads of the bolt and then they have a weird spacing because they're not in exactly the right rotation and you get tiny, tiny spacings where they're not lined up. Uh, it's used, mostly used just for, uh, it would be really inconvenient. It's not gonna give you what you want if you wanna uh, tension them or compression them all together with the bolts. So this is, a, this is a really common mistake that people make. Uh, if you call a bolt a screw, no one's going to make fun of you. But uh, just so we know the difference, bolts usually require a threaded nut or a hold in a part to make a joint. Uh, they also have constant diameter, and they require a hole to already exist when they are used. They cannot self-drill, uh, so they need a hole already to be drilled out for them. Um, screws are never used with a nut, as far as I know. It says always, yeah, always used without a nut. Yeah, N no nuts for this one. They have a non-constant uh, cross section, so we can see in this image here they sort of taper down into a point, and that's to help. So this is probably like a self-piloting screw, uh, so that you could screw it directly into something. Um, they usually can be screwed directly into a material, but it's always if you do a lot of woodworking, you know that it's always better to start with a pilot hole. Uh, so the wood doesn't split or anything like that. But that's the difference uh, so that you don't have to ever make that mistake again. So one of the things we talked about was washers. Um, washers are used to distribute load over a larger area. So uh, here, I have a question for you guys. If you remember what Sean told us in his last lecture on stress, do you remember the equation for stress? Or maybe the units even. Yeah, that's good. We have an answer in chat. Force over area. Nice, awesome. Yes, so force over area. So when we apply, when we increase the area that a force is applied over, we get less stress. So the denominator becomes larger, we get less stress overall. Another thing that uh, washers do is they increase friction um from more area and we the bolt is less likely to come out from loose vibrations or loose from vibrations uh whatever it's experiencing uh usually they are placed under the bolt head but not the nut but sometimes the nut too depending on how much you want to distribute the stress um these two here are different kinds of lock washers so what lock washers do is they add a little bit of force on both the part and the uh either the nut or the bolt head, and they give it that little extra bit of tension that keeps it um, tightened against itself and also prevents loosening over time. Aw, oh, nuts. 
<laughs> okay, sorry, I need just a second. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about nuts here. We have some examples of nuts. So uh, a reminder that you don't always need to have a nut with a bolt. A uh, bolt can also screw directly into a piece if the piece is threaded. Uh, you can tap a hole, and tapping is the process of cutting threads into a hole. Uh, and then this bolt, and the bolt could go directly into the material. But if you do need a nut, here are some options. Um, the first is a basic type of nut you usually see. It's just a hex nut that you screw on. Um, not much interesting here. A lock nut is uh, usually has some sort of uh, material or seal. Uh, that makes it more difficult for the nut to come unthreaded. So this is another solution that they found for uh, eventually loosening over time and cyclical loads or something like that. Um, a common brand of lock nut is Nylock, which people do like the Kleenex for tissue kind of thing. Like some, if people refer to uh, this as a Nylock, they're doing that like mix up. Uh, sometimes people just refer to this as Nylock. A wing nut, um, they have these flanges that peek off of them, which makes them really, really easy to tighten and untighten easily. Um, and they are used when you want to be able to remove something quickly or put it back together quickly um, by hand. This last, this coupling nut slash standoff, um, it's good for creating spaces between two items. I'm not sure uh, what else you would use it for. Maybe if you had two bolts going into a common area you could use the, the this standoff because it's threaded on both sides to do that um, yeah but generally used for spaces and again uh, as i said before you want to make sure that you maintain engagement and get the best results from your uh, nut and bolt combo you want at least three threads of the nut sticking past the end of the bolt i'm sorry uh, three threads of the bolt sticking past the end of the nut all right pins so these are used to lock two parts together. Usually they constrain rotation. Um, and then once you, you can do one pin, you can constrain it at, at, to rotate about an axis. You put another pin in a different location. Now it's uh, locked in position for that plane. Um, as I mentioned before, sometimes it's used as the first point of pay, uh, failure to protect something more important. Uh, pins are pretty cheap. They're just tiny pieces of metal. So if they break and my really intricate designed piece doesn't break like that's that's what I would want. Uh, it could also so as I mentioned if you just put one pin in now the body can rotate along that pin uh, with that being the axis of rotation so sometimes it's used for that as well. They're occasionally used in advanced machining techniques uh, to locate the workspace and so that means lining up values corresponding values that you want to uh, that you want to keep constant throughout a machining process. Um, yeah, here's a dowel pin, which is very common. So this is very common in the machining practices. This is what you would use to uh, make sure things are on the same corresponding workspace. Um, this here is a, a cotter pin. It is used so that along this shaft, things don't really slide. So this blocks the sliding here. Um, yeah. I don't know if I have an example of a cotter pin in use. Well, if you have one, if Sean or Keaton have one, uh, let me know if there's one in the chat. If you just want to, if you if you like love cotter pins, um, let me know. But I'll move on for now. Uh, so we talked about pins. I think next is set screws. Set screws. So as I said before, they're the interfaces between a shaft and what is rotating with that shaft, whether that's a gear or um, maybe a wheel or something like that. Um, as I mentioned before, they need a flat component to interface really well. So you can imagine the set screw has this little taper at the end that we see you can sort of see here and then a flat face. It is best if that is in contact with another flat face, so you can get the most um, bang for your buck. It's sort of hard to see here, but there's a line. The shaft is cut what looks like right down the middle uh, so that this set screw on the, holding the gears rotation uh, can have the best interface. Excuse me. Um, usually these come in common bolt sizes in both metric and imperial. So uh, keep that in mind if you ever want to use a set screw, you should probably use a, a common um, bolt size. 
So here is an example of the cross section of a bolt, or I guess the maybe a side view uh, cross section in some places of a bolt, nut, and material assembly. Um, I think this has animations. What happens if I? Ooh, yeah, there's material one. So notice one thing to notice here is that uh, for this, for this uh, material, the sizing of the hole in it is larger than the bolt. So as I mentioned before, only the last thing that the bolt wants to interact with is threaded. So you see two clearance holes as we refer to them um, for this for this bolt for the two materials. Material one, material two. That's what fasteners do best. Yeah, we have a bolt head. The washer to distribute the load. So this bolt head actually has what looks like a built in washer um, to it. So as it comes down, it widens a little bit to help out with that. So we have a washer on the nut as well. Maybe these are uh, maybe this is a steel bolt and these are like HDP plastics and we don't want to hurt them when we tighten this down. And then we have the nut. OK, quick, quick quiz. What type of bolt is this? And if it's in chat, someone, someone read it out to me because I can't see. OK, Marvin times your shoulder. Correct, yeah. So we can tell it's a shoulder bolt because it has this unthreaded portion uh, right here. Correct, yep, awesome. So fasteners are not the only other uh, only ways to join materials. There are others, um, and I will go over them a little more in detail from the sections and we'll cover some like shaft assemblies in uh, next week's lecture. Um, but you can also join using friction based methods like press fit, taper fit and shrink fit what we're about to go into shaft assemblies uh, using collars or retaining rings to prevent sliding along the shaft. Uh, you can use adhesives like epoxy or uh, Loctite, uh, which are basically just really good glues. Uh, and you can also use welding. And I'm sure we're all familiar with welding a little bit of combining two materials. OK, can you just go back to the previous slide? Nick? Sure, yeah. OK, yeah, so Nick has a point here that it doesn't look like an actual shoulder bolt, just a longer hex bolt, because that shoulder isn't a polished axle. True, true. Uh, let me just. I think. Um, yeah, I could I could definitely be wrong, but I, I think shoulder bolts also just refer to the. Uh, I actually don't know, so yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is not a shoulder bolt. Maybe this is just uh, a not completely threaded bolt. I think if, if you call this a shoulder bolt, people would know what you meant, though. Um, yeah, so let's go. Let's go over what some of the friction based uh, fits are. So a press fit is caused by two parts in a, two parts, two parts interfering with each other. Uh, so this would be a smaller hole than a shaft diameter. And then you were to press them into each other. Those materials would interfere with each other because um, they they're trying to take up the same space and you would get a frictional uh, fit. A taper fit is created when two parts have an angle relationship with each other and tightening a fastener draws them closer as they slide against each other. So you can see here that we have this material here, which has a like concave angle, we'll say, and this one has a convex. And as you were to tighten this fastener, this would slide into this and become tighter and tighter. Um, when you all eventually go to the CMA, uh, this is how a collet fits into a mill. So when you receive machining training, this is how it does it. Uh, shrink fits are thermally loaded uh, fits. So you either heat something to expand it, like you heat the hole to make it larger, or you cool the shaft to make it smaller. You then place it down together in an assembly where they fit, whether heated or cooled. Uh, and then when you release the temperature, they interfere with each other. They shrink and interfere with each other. Uh, shaft assemblies. We okay. so we actually just yeah. a second. Okay, so I looked it up. So apparently, for a shoulder bolt, the shoulder has to be larger in diameter than the threaded part. Okay. Uh, yeah. I won't go back now, but I think it was pretty close. So I think it could be either one. Uh, thank you for looking that up, Sean. Though I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we're gonna go over shaft assemblies next week.
Um, so I'm not going to go over this super much, but basically what these allow you to do is to prevent things from sliding along a shaft. So if I have a shaft, if I have a, I don't have a pen here, but I'll use my finger as the shaft, it will prevent things from moving along this way or even uh, prevent the shaft from moving maybe. Um, both of these perform almost the same function, I would say. Then let's go into adhesives, my favorite. Uh, so these these are big boy glues. Um, <laughs> they can get really wicked strong. Uh, so uh, we have here uh, Loctite and uh, JB Weld, which are two common uh, adhesives that we use uh, to just combine anything. So this is aluminum, fiberglass, metal, plastic, composite, wood, and more. Very, very strong glues when you need them. Uh, Loctite does have some color coding. Uh, so if we wanted to use green, so green is for wicking. So that means if you have a press fit um, that is not quite up to spec, like it's a little bit, the hole is a little bit larger than it should be, or um, the shaft is a little bit smaller than it should be, you can use this, that you can use green uh, as a retaining compound and then put them together and it will just help that fit really stay together. Um, Blue is a removable strength one, so you can add this maybe if you uh, want to hold a, a bolt in place, but you are unsure if you need to remove it for a pair at some point. Uh, and then red is a very high strength uh, one, so this would be used if you do not want to remove that bolt, uh, but you want it to maintain its threat, like into its threading, uh, and not to loosen up as time goes on. So welding is the joining of two materials by heat or force. Um, there are two common types of welding, uh, MIG and TIG, which stands for metal inert gas and tungsten inert gas. Um, I believe you guys have access to these presentations. These links are a little long, and I, I, I won't go over them now, but they are pretty useful to talk about the differences between MIG and TIG. Um, so TIG, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, anyone, TIG, I believe, you can use lead metal or you can use the actual substrate. So that means I can either add metal to weld things two together or I can use the metal that's already there to uh, put it together. And I don't think you can do that for MIG. Um, but there, there are other differences as well, as you can see, as you'll see if you go through the videos. So when thinking about how you will assemble your design and which fasteners you use, uh, make sure you think about how you will put them in and if necessary, take them out. Uh, you can save a lot of hassle down the line and this is, this is referred to as uh, designing for assembly. So if you know, if I have a screw that needs to go into a place uh, to hold two pieces together, but I can never reach that place once I assemble the rest of it uh, and that piece needs to be removed frequently, that's not a good design, right? And so we would like to, suss that out before it happens and you have a you have a design problem uh, so here are some more rules about uh, rules to follow when thinking about fasteners um, generally you want to stick to one type of units so you either want to have your screws and bolts in uh, metric or imperial that would just make it easier uh, to keep things straight for you um, also, you probably want to reduce the number of different screws or, or bolts in your, um, see, I, I did it, uh, bolts in your assembly. So if you're looking at a bolt and you're like, oh, I can't tell if this is a 440 or a, uh, I don't know, 432. I don't even know if that's a size. Uh, Imperial, Imperial sucks, guys. Um, uh, but it will help you by just simplifying everything. So when you have to actually assemble, it's easier for you. Uh, but if you have two, so if you have two bolts and they're both metric and one of them's longer than the other, or one of them's wider than the other, you just know how everything's going to be assembled already before having to look up the size charts and what holes are what and everything like that. Um, make sure if you are using a threaded part that uh, you're using it to lock with a threaded fastener. So if you're, I'm using a bolt, make sure at, at the other end there's something to interact with it. Um, yeah. And lastly, always refer to a screw chart or ask a senior member if you're in doubt of 
what this sizing means probably they're just going to tell you to go look at the chart because they don't know either but maybe they're really good maybe they're better better uh remembering random numbers than i am uh okay so that's it for uh fasteners woohoo uh nice so we are going to go through a couple of CAD tools and tips, then we're going to do a Kahoot, and then uh, that's it for the lecture portion today. Uh, we'll go through the CAD guide. Uh, we'll skim over the CAD guide for anyone who wants it and stay around for questions. But after this, we're done. So the first tool I want to talk about uh, today is the Revolve and Revolve Cut. Um, these are really good to make groups for retaining rings or shaft collars. So uh, I would know I didn't talk about these a lot, but one of the things that are required for uh, shaft collars, I'm sorry, retaining rings, uh, maybe shaft collars too sometimes, but uh, for retaining rings is a little groove on the shaft uh, so that you can pop this ring in. And now it can't, and then the, the retaining ring is actually smaller than the outside diameter of your shaft, but it's uh, wider than that little cut you made, that little uh, cut you made in the diameter. So it would fit, let's say this is, um, it looks like this is 0.4 inches, so it's wider than 0.4 inches, but it's less than 0.8 inches. Um, and it would pop into here and then would stick out like a fan, and it would block anything from moving along this axis. Uh, I don't know if I explained that super well, so if you have any questions, let me know. Um, but Revolve and Revolve Cut um, help you can make some of these uh, orientations. So one of the ways to do it is you could make the profile of this like V and this uh, thing and then revolve it around like we did in the first lecture. Or you can make a cylinder by extruding and you could cut it out um, in a revolve cut. One of these ways I would say is better than the other and more closely resembles how we're actually going to do it. So how we're really going to do this, this uh, notch for the retaining ring is we're going to stick this piece on a lathe. We're going to spin it and we're going to cut it. Uh, and we'll go over what a lathe is later, but it, we're going to cut it out. So it's better to cut it out in your CAD as well. So we're thinking about uh, design for manufacturing. Uh, rather than to make it like this. Both are both are able to be done. You can get the same part both ways. Uh, another thing we want to talk about is fasteners and holes in CAD. Um, you can usually grab CAD models of the fasteners from suppliers or vendors and then import them into your assembly. You don't have to CAD them yourself. Particularly some of them are pretty hard to CAD. Um, so just grab the ones online if they have them. Um, so when you're actually making the holes in the part that you want to use, in order to make the holes first sketch the location, uh, usually using points as the markers for the um, center point of the holes, uh, and then use the hole tool to make actually make the 3D feature. Um, so if you use the hole tool and select the correct sizes of the bolts and the threading, it does a lot of the math for you. And it's really convenient if you need to go back, say, oh, you find out that in under load, your screw, your bolt doesn't work uh, and you need to increase its size. Really convenient to use the whole tool to just change it to the next size up instead of looking up uh, what is the nominal dimension of this whole size, then extrude cutting it out. Um, so please use the hold tool. It's uh, very, very helpful. For hole options, there are a couple. Uh, there are a couple choices. So simple hole is straight up and down the nominal dimension of uh, of the hole. So if it's 0.25, it's 0.25 inches. Um, clearance hole is slightly larger uh, than the nominal dimension. So a 2.5 inch diameter bolt could fit easily through it. So it does that math for you. A taper hole or a tapped hole. I'm sorry. Before we go into taper is what I was referring to before. So it's a smaller than nominal dimension. So if it's 0.24 or 0.25, let's say it's like 0.23 or something. Um, and that this is because we're going to tap it. And so tapping involves uh, using a tool and cutting and removing material in order to make those internal threads. So you can imagine how a, how a nut was made. So a nut was, uh, before it had the threads on the inside, it was just a piece of uh, a hexagonal, let's say steel. And they took a tool and they cut out the inside of those threads so that it would match up with the bolt. Um, we have tools to do that at the shop, not with steel, but uh, with aluminum. <laughs> uh, lastly, a taper tapped hole. So this is what we would use for that, um, that what was it called, uh, a taper fit, uh, just like the, 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 the collets in the mills do. Uh, you will need a CNC machine to do this, I'm almost positive, and it's pretty rare, I've never seen anyone use it in RoboJackets. Um, 
So yeah, it's pretty rare. Seating options, there are a couple for that as well. Uh, this is how the head of the bolt interacts with the surface of the part. Put part. Um, so I mentioned before countersinking, and that's when you have a flat head screw with that V we talked about, removing the material so that a V can sit perfectly in the part. Uh, that is called countersinking, um, and that is different from counter boring. So counter boring is a very similar thing, but it's removing a cylinder of material instead of like a V, or like a, a conical shape of material. Um, so if you were to counter bore a piece, like maybe you could sit, get a um, Yeah, did different different bolt sizes in different bolts uh, heads in. Um, spot facing is the removal of just enough material around the bolt so it lies flat on the surface of the part. Uh, so sheet metal parts, there is an option in Inventor. These are just uh, things that will be useful to you in general in the future. Uh, there's an option in Inventor that converts. Um, normal parts like ordinary part files into sheet metal parts. Um, and so you, uh, yeah, you can see the workflow here. You go to the top ribbon environments, convert, convert to sheet metal, uh, and then you can have um, a sheet metal part. And so what that is going to ask you to do is it's going to ask you to establish a face and then to produce off that face. And a flange is just like a piece of material, a thin piece of material that sticks out. Uh, we use this when we are creating a part of uniform thickness that is made of sheet metal. Um, and so you will, we'll see on the next slide, but we inventor will take the part that you have and automatically make the 2D profile cut out for you so that when you're trying to make this, when you're trying to bend the sheet metal piece up and around, uh, you have the 2D profile already ready for you before you bend it. Yeah, so we can see we have uniform thickness and made from sheet metal stock. So this is what the part will look like when we actually bend it. But before we bend it, uh, Inventor will actually say like, hey, this is the part that you need to you need to cut out from the water jet or, or anything like that. And then you can start bending these and it will make this 3D piece. So last CAD tip of the day, um, make sure you choose what workspace you're working in wisely. So, um, and this can be, you can see this by what the type of file is. So part file, it will be uh, IPT, so Inventor part file. Um, if you're working in an assembly, it will be an IAM, Inventor Assembly, or if you're working in a drawing, it will be either a Inventor Drawing file or a, a DWG file. Um, your different environments are going to give you tools to really help you out. Uh, like if you were to try to create parts in an assembly, you wouldn't have the sketching features and extrusion features and all the things really available to you, though they might be there from some shenanigans. Uh, in the same the same way, if you were making a, an assembly and you just kept creating parts and parts, you wouldn't get to the knowledge of interaction between uh, your different parts and also your model tree would be a disaster. <laughs> Another thing to keep in mind is that um, there are a number of uh, manufacturing operations that use the actual CAD model in their uh, production. So a common example of this is 3D printing. And so when you export uh, to 3D printing, you're going to want to use STL and you're going to want to set a couple of uh, settings to really help you get the best model out of it. Um, so one of the things is to change it all to millimeters because it's the standard for 3D printing and it will interact with your slicing software the most. Um, yeah, you can end up, you export with settings uh, or high settings so that you end up with um, better resolution on your model instead of something that could mess up if it was important to a slicing, soft, a sl a slicing software for uh, 3D printing. All right, are there any questions before we get into this game? All right. So let's see if I click. So uh, go to kahoot.it and I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, and I'm going to is for and I'm going to stop sharing and 
I'm going to bring up Kahoot. We are on mechanical training week three. Give me a second. Kahoot tried to get me to upgrade to premium. We've seen past their tricks. Let's do it. I am going to include computer sounds so you guys are ready. Nice. Now, 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 James. Why would you use a flat head bolt? Nice. So flat head bolts um, are used when you want it the, to sit flush with the surface of the uh, part. Uh, they're the ones with the, the conical shaped element that you need to cut out and then sit against. Uh, they don't, they, Cool. No, they don't really distribute force over a greater area, though I guess you could make a case for that uh, because of there's more surface area they come in contact with. That's what washers are for, yeah. distributing force. Yeah. All right. Nice. Which of these aren't your real bolt? Yeah, so tapered is not, we, we talked about bolts, they have a constant cross section, except when they're uh, shoulder bolts, right? Um, so taper doesn't really make sense for a bolt. True or false, screws and bolts have a constant diameter along the threaded body. I wonder what the answer to this one is. Right, so uh, screws generally taper down into a point uh, so that they can uh, go into material. All right, next. Oh, we got an on fire. Which is not a way to constrain a ship. Right, so I didn't cover this, so this is my bad because we're covering it next week. Uh, but a way, a not a way to constrain a shaft. So a shaft collar also prevents moving along an axis. Uh, retaining ring prevents moving along the shaft. A set screw uh, could trap a, a, a shaft down uh, so it doesn't rotate. A lock washer is used for uh, bolts to tension, to increase their tension so that they're, um, they're less likely to Unthread. Well, 
Actually, if you tap the end of a shaft, you could put a bolt and washer in the end to retain stuff. No, that's true. Yeah, you could. Maybe this is a bad question. I don't know. Washers give all but the fuck. Nice. So it keeps stray material out of the t tapped hole. It does not do that. Uh, it could, I, I think material could still get in. Um, though I guess... This is an interesting question. Applies force upwards on the nut. Uh, if if the nut is in compression, it would also apply force upwards into the nut. I'm not sure how that's a benefit, Sean or Keaton, uh, or anyone. Uh, how that would be a benefit. Locking property. Sure. OK, so uh, um, lock washers uh, increase, oh, I think, uh, increase the tension. Yeah, yeah I absolutely. Say is that it sort of tightens the place yeah like you know how you can like screw a nut in but it's not like tightened all the way and so like the bolt can still go like move along its axis yeah definitely uh so, yeah yeah it, yep. and we talked about um it can be used as a spacer and it can be used to reduce the stress on the bolt so the only one left is that it doesn't keep stray material out of the tap hole Which screw head type strip is the easiest? Right, so we talked about how Phillips heads, uh, if you ever used one, you, you know that it strips easy. And that's because it uses uh, like a conical. So if you've seen the tip of a Phillips head screwdriver, it's like pointed, right? And it uses to engage uh, with the seat to turn in, uh, and that's not a very good uh, design, I will say, though they're very common. OK, OK. Which Loctite color is thread lock? Oh. I don't know this one. I know I just said it, but I don't remember this one. Red, okay. Yes, okay, so blue is uh, when you want to remove it uh, more easily. Um, when you think at one point you're going to remove uh, it for either repair or adjustment, and then red is the one that is more permanent. Yeah, good job, guys. You remember more than your... Uh... So blue is, I don't know if it's considered a thread locker because it is impermanent. It is meant to be removed at some point. Um, but maybe there's a blue Loctite as well. That is a thread locker. Friction fits between all the Right, so uh, expansion fits aren't, uh, they're usually, an expansion fit, I think it would be the same thing as a shrink fit, but we refer to it as a shrink fit from thermally loading a piece. Um, taper fits are when you have uh, two pieces that have an angular relationship, so one piece is like this, and one piece is it's uh, negative, basically, and you have a uh, screw here or a fastener uh, that as you tighten it, they become closer and closer together, and they lock. Uh, there's a lot of chains up, change ups in this one. Which pair is completely made up? Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Good. So uh, the two general uh, Welding terms are MIG welding and TIG welding, which stand for metal inert gas and tungsten inert gas. Big wet welding and FIG welding, well, 
sound excellent. They're they're not real things. Nice. All right, last question it's for all the marbles. What is not a viable application of ribbons? So uh, battery casing for your robot, um, rivets have to go through the material that they're uh, putting together, right? So they, they pierce through and then they um, deform to keep them together. Uh, generally, puncturing your battery casing is no good. <laughs> uh, we use lipos a lot and those would explode if you pierce them. All right, let's see. Can I get a drum roll, please? I, I do hope you're all drum rolling. Looks like that one has a question. Yeah, I, yeah. Nice job. Now we're going to go through a really quick uh, version of the CAD guide, just skimming over it, uh, and then we'll be around if you have any questions. <laughs> GG no re. Um, this one. Uh, so this is our third week's CAD guide. Uh, we're going to be designing some stuff with holes in it, uh, some threads in it, uh, and generally just testing our CAD knowledge. So first we're going to be looking, and I'm just going to skim over this very briefly. First we're going to be looking at the hole tool, whatever it's, uh, we went over some of its um, features, but how do we use them, where are they, um, what to do with it. Uh, yeah, why do we, what do we use and all the buttons mean? Um, how do we decide depth and direction? If you want to custom, how do you do that? Choosing location. So usually uh, we choose either a sketch to do it, or we use a circle that already exists in some element. If it's like a wheel and you're putting a hole in the center, you can use concentric. Uh, but sketch is definitely the most common. We say where the positions would exist um, with points usually. So this is what we're going to be making uh, in this CAD guide. We're going to be making the battle bot, uh, the the weapon for oh, which Keaton, help me out here, please. I'm not sure myself. But... It was it was a uh, Corey's, I think. It was Corey's and Josses, Josses. But anyway, this is this is a battle bot that existed, and this is its weapon. Uh, so we're going to start by making a sketch. We're going to do the profile. Um, it's a little, a little wonky, so we're going to have a circle and then some uh, splines that come out to it. Uh, we're going to remove some of the material. We're going to uh, tell them the location of the holes. So as, as we talked about before, usually you use a sketch to make holes and then you uh, put points saying where you want it. So this is along the midpoint, and then half an inch out and an inch. So while we're in the um, hole tool, we can select this sketch, and then it will already. <laughs> you want to control my screen? <laughs> That's OK. I'm OK right now. Um, the uh, so it will it will immediately select the points that it knows you want to use and uh, create a depth into it of what you, whatever you set, whatever you set your classification to be, whole diameter and depth. Yes, so this could have been done with a pattern. There are many ways to produce the same uh, linear placement of holes. Uh, you could do them on one side and then mirror them out or a number of other ways. So these are the settings that you're going to be using. So they list them all here. We're going to use a um, number 10 screw. So this is in the Imperial unit system. Um, it's 24 inches per thread, thread per inches, sorry. 
Um, creating a instance instead. That's a that's a large thread. Uh, then we're going to make the D slot in the center of the disk, so this will help us um, actually rotate the material. Because we think if you have a piece that you want to rotate and you put a perfectly cylindrical element into it, and you spin that cylindrical element, there's no way that it can move that larger portion that you actually want to rotate. And so just like the uh, set screws, if you cut a D into your shaft and then uh, it, you leave a D in your, you stop requesting control. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you leave a D in your um, part, um, <laughs> Uh, you can then uh, put them together and rotate. Uh, you throw me off, guys. Um, yeah, so they're going to make the D here. So this is a very small D, so you're just cutting off a little bit of the element. Um, yep, you're going to make some holes off of it. You're going to pattern the holes around. And that's it. You've made the actual uh, aluminum piece of the battle butt. So congratulations. Um, it looks like you're also going to do a really basic sheet metal design and then make a uh, part file of it, of a DXF of it, which is what we use in the water jet to cut. Um, so one process is to go through and go directly to the convert to sheet metal. So start in a normal file and then go to convert to sheet metal, or you could just start a sheet metal file. Um, set some of the options, like thicknesses, Right, because uh, sheet metal parts always have the same thickness, their uniform thickness. Uh, you can start the process. You can go um, select a face that you'll begin with and then just go for it like you would a sketch. Uh, yeah, so you can set the bend radius of what you want your part to be, so how much you will bend it or how thick it will be. Uh, and you can start making 3D elements like flanges. Yeah, so now you can make the walls by uh, selecting the sides and saying like, oh, I want the flanges to come up, which are these sticking out elements here. Um, but use the edges of the top of the wall to create the flange. OK, so uh, they're going to ask you instead to do the same thing again, but use the top of the walls instead of the bottoms. Uh, mitered edges are a thing from woodworking that are also used in sheet metal. Uh, so a mitered line is when uh, two angled pieces are joined together to usually make a 90 degree, though it could be other angles, uh, but they join the corner like this. And so it looks like they're auto mitering the corners so that they connect. And then you create a flat part which we use to make drawings, the DXF. Yeah, so uh, you're going to convert it back to a flat part because we're going to cut this out of sheet metal on a water jet, which is a 2D uh, machining process. And there it is. That's that's what the part's going to look like when you actually cut it out before you do any of the bends. Yep, you can still add features to it, and you can toggle back and forth by uh, clicking the same uh, setting that you use to go into flat part. And there you go. That's it. That's it. A lot of content today, but hopefully, hopefully it was entertaining. Do I have any questions? You guys can't request control of my screen anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> all right, well, if there's nothing else, that's all we have for today. Um, if you have any questions with the CAD guide, can I get a new attendance link? I forgot to click it, now expired. Sure. Keaton, is that is that possible? Sure is. Hell yeah, OK. Keaton's, Keaton's on the move. Yeah, but would it count for the same session? That's a I believe it would. Because I think the, uh, it just records like timestamps and whatnot. OK. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, let me know. Or if you want to um, just vibe, I'm, I'm also down. Link is up. In the chat. Thank you. Three, two. Uh, here we go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Keaton. No problem. I've got the Coots song stuck in my head. <laughs> I'm thinking now, at least uh, for next year, we probably should do this lecture 
before the whole lecture, you know? The whole lecture. Yeah, so the one I gave, I was talking about, like, mm -hmm. the whole tool. Um, and, yeah, so, like, knowing, like, what, 432 and, like, all the yeah. tab size and whatnot um, would That's be good, good context. I also think, I think this, I think a couple things for this lecture. I think um, some of these don't seem to connect. Like, we cover shaft assemblies, mm -hmm. like, literally next, next, next lecture. Um, and so I'm wondering if I should have just touched on them more here and then left next week to go over it more. I also think the, like, I think the, the, the shaft assemblies and revolve hmm. cut could I mean, have been. There was only an issue because the question came up in Kahoot. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Hmm. True. Which, I mean, I felt like that question could still be solved with a little bit of logic. Yeah, it, but it's hard to tell because... Uh, not logic, just like... Just deducing that the other things are applicable. Yeah, you know that... What, what was the question? What is a way not to constrain the shaft? Shaft collar, retaining ring, set screw, and lock washer? Yeah, I think I think that could have been figured out with just, um, we know that lock washers are used for bolts, but I guess um, that one, I forget the name of the uh, student, but he said like, you could have contained it with, you could constrain it with a lock washer theoretically mm -hmm. uh, with the bolt, but that's, we can talk about this on uh, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, see you guys. Awesome. Thank you guys. Have a good day. You too. Cool. See you.